everybody, and thank you so much for being here today. Before we start, first thing, let's talk about masks. We want to make sure they're on and they're covering your nose, okay? Double check on your nose. We good? All right. When the speakers come off up, you'll notice that they take their masks off just for a second, and then when they come off stage closer to you, they'll put them back on, okay? So, friends, thank you for being here today, and welcome. You are sharing a very important moment with us, so we're really glad you get to be here with us. And thank you for all the hard work you did earlier today and those amazing questions you generated. We're gonna try to get as many questions answered as we can today, but have faith, we'll make sure that your questions are heard. They're just too amazing to uh, not listen to, okay? As we're going forward, um, I thank you for your kindness and attention and respect as our honored guest speaks. So, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Samantha Dorfman, a current junior in our upper school who worked tirelessly to make this day a reality. She'd like to offer a few words to welcome Dr. Better. Hello, uh, I'm Samantha, as Ms. Follett mentioned, and I want to thank you all for being here today. Before formally introducing our incredible speaker, I would like to share an excerpt from her website that says, Refusing to be an enemy is simple, profound, and anybody can do it. It is looking the other person in the face. It is listening. It is the conscious decision to open your eyes, your ears, and your heart. It is the serious intention to see the other person as human and not a stereotype. But it comes with the responsibility we owe to every person to stand on the side of tolerance. The world cannot afford us to be bystanders in the face of oppression and hate. More than 80 years have passed since the Holocaust took place, but many people regard it as history that is too far removed to have relevance to their own lives. But the truth is that there are so many important lessons to be learned from the Holocaust. And so I feel incredibly grateful to introduce our speaker, Dr. Irene Butter. Irene was born in Berlin and grew up as a Jewish child in Nazi-occupied Europe. A survivor of two concentration camps, she came to the U.S. in 1945 and has been sharing her story since the late 80s. She has given numerous talks in the U.S., Israel, and Germany to help youth understand the gravity of genocide and to motivate them to stand up against hatred, prejudice, and racism. In addition, she's the co-creator of the University of Michigan Wallenberg Medal and Lecture, which provides human humanitarian role models for students and the community. She is also the co-founder of an Arab Jewish Women's Dialogue Group. We are so thankful to have her speaking to us today. So again, please join me in welcoming Dr. Irene Butter. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Samantha. I'm very happy to be here today, especially since today and tomorrow are Holocaust Memorial Day, which are um, days every year, one day every year to remember the Holocaust. I'm going to tell you about my journey, my early childhood, and primarily until I arrive in America. The next slide, please, will show you a map of all the, des des no, just keep it there, please, of all the places I had to travel to uh, at the beginning of the Holocaust. Uh, it wasn't a journey of choice. My family and I did not decide to go to all these places. And so that is one thing to be remembered. I was born in Berlin, and that's the first spot on the map in Berlin, Germany, and had an extremely happy, joyful childhood. I'll talk about all these 
stations uh, more as we go along. After the Nazis came to power, my family fled Germany in order to escape the persecution of the Jews and went to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. We lived there for two years peacefully and then the Nazis invaded Holland, occupied it, and the persecution continued. We were sent to Camp Westerbork first, which was a German concentration camp in Holland. And after some time, we were transferred to Bergen-Belsen, a concentration camp in Germany. We were there for almost one year, barely surviving, when we were included in a exchange transport that liberated us from the hell of Bergen-Belsen. We were put on a train to Switzerland and on the journey, uh, my father died and the train stopped and uh, his remains were taken off the train. And my mother, my brother and I had to continue the journey this was still during World War II, and we were sent to Switzerland, France. There, my mother and brother were immediately taken off the train because they were extremely ill and taken to a hospital. But I was not allowed to stay with them, and uh, I was then 14 years old and sent further away to a refugee camp in Algeria. So this is the journey. And now we will go into some of the details. The first slide, please. This is a wedding picture of my parents. The next slide. I'll do this pretty quickly so we have more time for questions later. You see here my brother, he, Werner. He was two years older than I. Uh, he was three and I was about one. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of my father and me when I was about five years old. I adored him. He was my hero. He was my idol. Next slide. I had the fortune to live with my grandparents in the same house, and they were very loving and playful and generous. And here you see a picture of my grandfather holding my brother and my grandmother holding me. And we had a very close, loving relationship. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we had a very loving family and my childhood was idyllic. But when Hitler came to power, my grandfather, who owned a bank, was no longer allowed to keep his bank. My father was his partner, so my father became unemployed. And that was one reason to leave for Holland um, so my father could find work, and he did. And so this is where we lived in Amsterdam. And I'm showing the house where Anna Frank lived, assuming that some of you may have read an Anna Frank's diary. Her family also came from Germany. They were also Jewish. They immigrated to Holland and she lived in my neighborhood. I did not know her well, but you can see that her house, the architecture is very similar to the house that my family and I lived in. The next slide, please. This is a picture that was taken of every student in school in, the, in Holland, a typical school bench, students sitting there with a notebook, a pen in the hand, and Anna went to a different school, and yet there is the same picture. I think this is about third grade of public school in the Netherlands. Next slide. So when the Nazis invaded the Netherlands, two years after our arrival, the persecution escalated. 
and many restrictions were put on the lives of Jews. And so this is a sign that symbolizes what was happening. This is the biggest park in Amsterdam and a big sign forbidden for Jews. There were many other restrictions. For example, we had a curfew. We had to be in at eight o'clock every evening. We couldn't go to public places like movie houses, theaters, museums, swimming pools, many other places, as well as we could not use public transportation. People who weren't Jewish could not visit us in our home, and we were not allowed to visit the homes of pe other people who were not Jewish. Uh, we were not allowed to go to food stores until after three o'clock. And here it was wartime and many shortages of foods. And by three o'clock, many times, the shelves were empty. So that was an, another restriction. At one point, our bicycles were taken away. And since we couldn't use buses or trams to get around the city, and the bicycles were taken away, our lives became very circumscribed. And there were other restrictions. We had to wear the Star of David on our clothing whenever we were outdoors so that everybody could see that we were Jewish. And so on, so on. Uh, Jewish kids could no longer go to the schools, the public schools in Amsterdam, and we were forced to go to Jewish schools. The Jewish school was much further from my home than the school I had been attending. And without bicycle, I spent more time of the day walking to and from the school. But beyond all of these restrictions, the worst part was the deportation. They started deporting Jews to concentration camps, arresting them on the street, sometimes at the workplace, sometimes at home. I think most of the Jews were arrested from their homes. The next slide, it shows you the, the method the Nazis used to deport Jews. It was called a razzia. And a razzia meant an incursion into a neighborhood where they blocked off the entire neighborhood, forced everyone to get off the streets. And then the Nazis went from house to house, from door to door, looking for the Jews. And when they identified the Jew, then they gave you 10 minutes to pack your belongings and you had to leave your home. Your, the door of your home was sealed and nobody, were, nobody was allowed to enter that place after they had forced you out of your home. So what you see here, a picture of the Jews having forced out of their home, carrying bundles, carrying suitcases, young people, old people, babies, and they are being marched to a big square. And the day when I was deported, it was a hot day in June, and we were all lined up on this big square until the entire neighborhood had been searched for the Jews. And then they came in trucks and they loaded all of us on trucks and took us to the railway station. The next slide. Now here you see what was waiting for us when we reached the railway station. Uh, this was the train in which Jews were deported to the concentration camps. It wasn't a, a person train. It was a train used to transport cargo, wares, not people, maybe animals, but not people. And so they loaded us into these cattle car wagons, squeezing us into each of these 60, 70 people into one of them. 
which meant we were squeezed like sardines in a, in a can, which may, you may have seen. There was so little space, sometimes not even enough on the floor for people to sit, but they had to sit on each other's laps. And when all the people were loaded into the cattle car train, then they closed the doors and the, tr the car had no food, no drink, I mean, no water, no toilet, and no air because there were no windows. And people had to sit in these wagons for hours and hours, and often for days until they reached the, um, guess, the, the death camp in Eastern Europe. Now, we were only going to a camp within the Netherlands and probably spent something like five to six hours um, in, in this kind of a train. But this was the beginning of the de deportation. And when we arrived in Vesterborg, we were then registered and inspected and assigned to barracks. The next slide. Now here you can see what Vesterborg looked like. The barracks were all lined up close to one another. And then on the right side, you see the interior of the barrack. Most of the space was filled with three tiered steel framed bunk beds. And everyone was assigned to a bed. The only space allowed to you would be one third of the floor underneath the bunk where you could keep your belongings. And this is how we lived. The barracks were divided into two sections, one for the men and one for the women. Uh, we could be together all day long, but the bunks were assigned for sleeping purposes. Men and women were separated. There was some furniture, some picnic type tables and benches where people could sit to eat their meals. Now, Westerborg in retrospect wasn't all that bad. The adults had to work every day. Um, the labor they were assigned to, it wasn't pleasant. There were long work days, but it wasn't um, as horrible as in the labor camps or in the death camps. The men had to do some work in the shops. <laughs> maybe technical work, repair things. And women worked in the kitchen or preparing vegetables. And um, we got three meals a day. So there, there was food, even if it wasn't always delicious. And for children like me, I was 12 years old when we came to Vesterborg. There wasn't anything to do. No school, no playground, no libraries, no books no toys, there really wasn't anything. So children spent the days together, but they didn't really know what to do. Um, there, there, was, there was some entertainment, there was the theater, and there were some performers who were allowed to um, present plays and um, shows, but um, that was only some of the time, kind of contradictory to have entertainment in a concentration camp, but it was primarily for the Nazis who were administering the concentration camps that they got some entertainment. Well, anyway, the worst part of being in Vesterborg was, again, the deportation. And what happened was that every Saturday afternoon, a train pulled in, a train just like the one I showed you that took people from Amsterdam to Vesterborg, and it pulled in on Saturday afternoon like clockwork every week, and it stood there the rest of Saturday, all day Sunday, and all day Monday. And the railway track was right in the center of the camp, so wherever you went, you couldn't avoid seeing this horrible train. And on Monday night, 
the paraplegists would turn on the light and they would read the names off a list of the people who had to board the train early in the morning to be sent to a camp in Eastern Europe. And that was trauma. That was the trauma of Vesterborg. Listening on Monday night where the Euro family was on the list. And when we didn't hear our name read, we always got dressed and went to other barracks to look for family, friends, or neighbors who were also in the camp and to check whether they had been on the list and were to leave that morning. And then we always spent the rest of the night with friends or the people dear to us until they had to board the train, knowing that pretty certain it was that we would never see each other again. And that was the trauma, because when the train left on Tuesday morning, we knew that next Saturday, the same train would pull up again. And who knows whether we or other, pe other people we loved would be selected to be, to be further deported. And now when the train came in on Saturday, people in the camp had to clean the wagons. And sometimes they found notes um, in, the, in the wagon that described what would happen to the Jews in Auschwitz. Most of the cattle car trains that left Westerbork went to Auschwitz, a few of them to other concentration camps. And so these notes revealed what was going on in these camps. And so we knew that once we were put on the train, we, we could guess what our fate would be. And that was the horrible trauma to, to be thinking about this all the time. Next week, the train returns and it might be my fate to be sent further. So we were in Westerbork for about four months and I have to move back um, to Amsterdam because one day in Amsterdam, my father met a friend and this friend had just received Ecuadorian passport from a consul in Sweden. And he gave my father the name of this person so he could right away to also get passports for our family because it was believed that if Jews had passports to the United States or a South or um, Central American country, then maybe they would not be killed. Maybe that would save their lives. And so my father rode away to this council and the passports never arrived in Amsterdam before deportation. But after four months in Westerbork, the pa a package came and when my father opened it, it included four passports for my parents, my brother and me to Ecuador. And this was a magical thing because it's changed our status in Westerbork. We were no longer just you Jews to be deported to a death camp, but we became exchanged Jews. And this meant that according to a policy passed by the Nazis, Jews who had these passports were going to be saved as exchange Jews so the Nazis could use them uh, to exchange them for German citizens who lived in these countries, who had left Germany earlier in the 20th century, and they would be forced to go back to Germany in exchange for Jews. And so this is possibly the only time I ever saw my parents smile during our stay in Westerbork because that was a sign of hope that these passports arrived. So we stayed in Westerbork four more months, and then 
we were transported to Bergen-Belsen, a camp in Germany, which was called an exchange camp. And um, let's see the next slide. This gives you an idea of what the passport looked like that we received, and, and this was my passport pictures. picture. Next slide. So we were told before we left Vestaburg that Bergen-Belsen would be a better camp. And also that we wouldn't be there very long because the Nazis would use us for exchange for German citizens. So when we arrived, this is what we saw. The barracks didn't look very different from the barracks in Vestaburg, but the people at this barbed wire fence, which was, was the first site we have of Bergen-Belsen, they looked very thin. They were wearing rags. They had sad expressions on their faces. And uh, the way they looked, it just didn't give the image that this would be a better camp. People in Vestaburg didn't look like this. And it was true. Our first impression was true to reality because Bergen-Belsen was a horrible camp. Uh, to begin with, the adults had to do slave labor. Very hard work from early morning into the evening and even this Saturday, they had to do half a day of work. Uh, I mean, even Sunday, they had to do half a day of work. So six and a half days, leave, getting up very early, leaving the camp for hard labor. Uh, my father was on a c construction team. They had to build barracks, uh, dig trenches, and do other very strenuous labor. My mother was in some sort of a factory where they had to pull apart clothing to separate the good fabric from, from the deteriorated fabric and save it for, so that people could sew new clothing. My brother, who was then 14, was also considered um, ready for labor. And he worked in a shoe commando where they tore apart the shoes to save the good leather to make new boots um, for mostly for soldiers in the army, so it, labor was very difficult. We only got three meals, we only got minimal food in this camp, like a small piece of bread that had to last all day, and a soup at night that was made of turnips boiled in water. That was the, the meal every single night with a few exceptions of the whole time we were there. It wasn't an adequate diet for people to do slave labor. In addition to that, the hygienic conditions were terrible. We were living in a very congested space. The bathrooms were filthy. There was only cold water and no soap. And all of us were infested with lice. And lice are the transmitters of diseases. So they were epidemics in Bergen-Belsen, most people got sick and many, many people died from the major um, infectious disease was typhus and it was the big killer, but there are many other diseases like pneumonia, cholera, um, polio, dysentery uh, and, and others. Uh, my father, pneumonia early in, in the time spent in Bergen-Belsen. He was hospitalized for a few days, but I'm not sure that he ever really recovered from it. And my mother took sick after a few months. She couldn't get, she was so weak, she couldn't get out of bed anymore. And I had to take care of her. And um, given the, the conditions of living, hard labor, minimal food, poor hygiene, and infectious diseases, you can imagine that the chance of survival was very limited. 
Now, in addition to this, there was roll call every day. And roll call meant, I think the next slide shows the square. On the left side, you see the square. This is an aerial view, so you can't see it too well. But this is where all the people were lined up during roll call. We had to stand in rows of five and hundreds of people were on this square to be counted. And for some reason, the Nazis often didn't, couldn't reach the right figure. And that's why we had to stand there for hours and hours, stand in place, no talking, no sitting down. And some people just couldn't tolerate that. And I will never forget the day when I saw an elderly woman sit down on the floor, on the ground, because she couldn't stand up any longer. And one of the Nazis came and really hit her, just bullied her, and she died. And that, I guess that was supposed to be an example. So you don't sit down during appell. And this went on every day. The people who went to work had to get up very early and they had their appell and the people who stayed in the barracks in the camps had their own. And sometimes for punishment, there was appell more than one time, even several times a day. So that was another form of torture. On the right side, you see the beds. And when the camp became more crowded, two people had to share a bed. So they were squeezed together on a narrow bunk bed, another way of spreading infectious diseases. Well, we had been in the camp almost one year, barely surviving. And there was an announcement that everyone who had a passport to an allied country, whether it was the United States or a South American country, needed to report to a Nazi doctor for screening. Now you have to remember there's hundreds of people who have these passports and they are screening because there is only a smaller group that's going to be selected to leave the camp for exchange. The next slide. All right, so that's a little bit ahead of our story. So the, so the announcement, we need to go to a certain place to be examined. And first my brother and I went to see this doctor and he okayed us. He checked us off on the list. And then we went back to the barrack, tried to get our mother uh, to also see the Nazi doctor, but she collapsed when we took her out of her bed, so she could not appear there. And then we didn't know what to do. Our father came back from labor in the camp and he looked very ill and he said he couldn't make it, but after some rest and our pleading with him, then he agreed and I walked with him to, to the screening place and the um, Nazi doctor asked him, was he John Hausler? He said, yes. Then he looked at me and he checked off my mother's name and told us to get ready to leave the camp the next morning. And that was a miracle because here I was 14 years old um, being mistaken for my mother in her 40s. Now we probably looked alike in some way. We, we, my mother and I both weighed 76 pounds when we got out of Bergen-Belsen, but she was in her 40s and I was 14, and we both wore rags, but how he could possibly mistake me for my mother is still a mystery, and uh, that's what saved our lives. Next day, we, well, I was just told the, the train that we boarded the next day was not a cattle car train. It was a Red Cross train. And this is a picture that
a drawing of one of the students in a school that I spoke to. And then on the right side is a picture of my father's remains on a bench. And as I mentioned, um, two nights, two days after we'd been on the train, my father died. And that was a terrible shock for my family because he had done everything possible to save our family. And then we were so close to freedom and he couldn't make it. So the Nazis took his remains and put it on a bench on the railway station in a town called Biberach. And we had to stay on the train and that's the last we saw of him as the train pulled out. It was about two days later when we reached the border of Switzerland where the exchange took place uh, in a town called Kreuzlingen and on one side of, of the platform was a train from Bergen-Belsen with the Red Cross on it and the other side had a train with people who came from, Germ from the United States who were Germans and there might have been some prisoners of war um, that participated in, in this exchange. And so the next slide, we are already in Algiers. We, um, our train took us to Southern France where we boarded a ship that took us to Algiers. And this is the refugee camp Remember, the war has not ended. Um, these are just some of the people in the camp. And on the right side, you see some young people that spent time together in the camp because, again, there was not much to do. No school, but we had freedom. In, in um, John Dark, uh, we, were, we were allowed to leave the camp anytime we wanted to. We could take a bus to another town and go to the movies. And if we, the camp was situated on top of a hill, walking down the hill, there was a beautiful beach, a beach of the Mediterranean Sea. And this is where I learned to swim in uh, Algiers. Um, so the war hadn't ended. My mother and my brother were in Switzerland and here I was in North Africa. I did not get any mail. I, I wasn't able to connect with them until more than three months because there was no mail during the war. And then I received a telegram saying that they were recovering, which of course was a great relief and a great joy for me. So here the war had ended and we were hoping to be reunited, but this did not happen. I was not able to go back to Switzerland to join my mother and my brother, and they never came to North Africa. So we were separated during all that time, not just by cities, but by con continents. They were in Europe and I was in North Africa. And finally, after being in Algiers for almost one year, um, I was able to get transportation to the United States. Now, during that time, um, we had family in the United States and we certainly didn't want to go back to Germany after the war ended. Uh, we, we didn't choose to go back to Holland because we had lost everything there all our family who had also moved to Holland were murdered. We didn't have any belongings. Everything was taken away from the family. And um, we, we wanted to go to America. And they helped us um, by providing the, the uh, information needed for visas, but it took a long time. So it was December of 1945 that I was able to get a ship, get on a ship um, to um, arrive 
in the United States. Next slide. Well, I was told on the Liberty ship that some of them broke in the middle of the Atlantic when there was a bad storm. And that really scared me. Luckily, we made it to Baltimore um, after spending three weeks on a turbulent ocean. But here's a picture that showed that some of the ships did break. And uh, so it wasn't a lie. Uh, I thought the doctor was just kidding me, but it wasn't, it wasn't a lie. So finally, I arrived in the United States. I stayed with cousins of my mother. Uh, they were wonderful. They treated me like their, old, their own child. And um, next slide. I, here is the beginning of, well, this is not just the beginning, but I wanted to go to school very badly because I hadn't been to school for three and a half years. So this is a graduation picture from high school. And then I, uh, when my mother and brother came to America, we were poor. We were penniless because Nazis had taken everything away from us. We were homeless because we didn't have a home. And we were stateless because Hitler deprived all Jews of their nationality. And you may know from news, newspapers that you read or reports you hear that many of the refugees all over the world these days, there are more refugees than ever. Many of them are stateless, which means that there isn't any country that has to let them in. And that's probably the worst status you can have as a refugee is to be stateless. And nobody wants refugees anyway. So here we were very fortunate to come to America. Even though we were poor, there were so many opportunities. For example, uh, New York City, where I lived, City colleges were tuition free. I would never have been able to go to college if it had been, if, if you had to pay the kind of tuition that is charged to people today. And, um, but the other picture shows that I worked during the summer. Uh, my brother took a job right away during the day and went to school at night. I went to school during the day and had after school jobs. And during the summer, I worked in hotels, in resort hotels as a waitress and um, helped to pay the bills of the family. Um, next slide. After graduating from college, I was able to go to university and I went to Duke University, very close to where you are on um, graduate fellowships. And at Duke University, I met my husband and we were there until we both um, got our PhDs. Mine was in economics and his was in neuroscience. Next slide. So in America, um, we first spent several years in the Washington DC area. I worked for the Federal Reserve System, uh, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, and my husband had a postdoctoral at National Institutes of Health. Um, after that, we moved to the University of Michigan, where we were both on the faculty for many years. And this is the beginning of our family, um, a daughter and a son, now they have their own children. Next slide. Well, these are my grandchildren. Um, the two girls on top, uh, when they were little, and I used to read stories to them, and our grandson, who is now 15, he lives in San Francisco, and on, below you see my great-grandchildren, the older granddaughter, has Adam, who's now three, and Maya, who is a year and a half. And we have a third great-grandchild that will soon be added to the picture. 
the next slide. So here I'm teaching economics at the University of Michigan. Um, next slide. Well, this is a historical picture. Um, the department I joined at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, it's a day of graduation. And all the graduates are standing in front. They're all males, they're all white. They all wear suits, white shirts and ties. And then behind them is the faculty and all of them are ma white males, suits, white shirts and ties. And then on the right side is me. I'm the only woman in the department. I'm on the faculty. And I'm showing this because today, the same picture would look very different, at least half of the students would be women, and probably at least one third, if not more, of the faculty would also be women. So I think since, since things have changed for the better, um, it's good to remember that we did make progress. Next slide, please. So my brother has two children and I have two children and one day, at a family reunion, they begged us to take them back to the sites of family history. And that was a shock for us because we never imagined we would go back, and certainly not to the concentration camps. But we couldn't turn down our children. So in 1991, we made this trip. And one of the highlights of the trip was Bergen Belsen. Next slide. Uh, this is this is just uh, shows it existed from 41 to 45. Let's do this quickly so we have more time left so we don't run out of time. Next slide. Uh, here you see a mass grave. And if you were ever to visit Bergen-Belsen, you would see many mass graves on this memorial ground. Hundreds of people were buried that way because when the Allies came to liberate Bergen-Belsen, uh, the entire camp was filled with dead bodies. And um, the people just didn't know what to do other than dig these big trenches and build mass graves. And my family has always been very grateful that my father was buried on a Jewish cemetery, has his own grave, and, and he wasn't, his fate was not to end up in a mass grave. Next slide. This is a, a, a gravestone for Anna Frank, of course. She and her sister also died in Bergen-Belsen. They would also be buried in a mass grave, but after the war, people have come to put up stones for relatives and you can see how many people have visited this site and left many mementos there. Next slide. So on this trip, we visited the cemetery where my father is buried with our children and on the right side, even one of the grandchildren. And I have been back to Germany half a dozen times, mostly to visit my father's grave. And um, I'm very grateful that there is a site for my children and their children to visit their ancestors. Next slide. And after many years of teaching at the University of Michigan, I was able to engage in peace work. And this is one of my activities to create an endowment at the University of Michigan to honor Raoul Wallenberg, who is, in my mind, the, the biggest hero of the Holocaust. Um, this endowment enables the university to invite outstanding humanitarians to, to um, visit and to serve as role models for the students and the entire community of what Raoul Wallenberg had done. He saved tens of thousands 
of Jews in Hungary from being sent to the death camps. Next slide. These are some of the medalists being invited to the, on the Wallenberg, under the Wallenberg project. Here's a picture of the Dalai Lama. And um, there are many other um, sometimes famous, sometimes not ever having um, met and not ever having received publicity heroes because they work on the cause of saving humanity. Next slide. Here are a few others. Uh, we'll just quickly look at them, but go on to the next slide. And uh, this is Daytona, which is an organization that I helped found consisting of six Palestinian and six Jewish women who meet every other week in their homes to address difficult problems and to work for peace. And our motto is refusing to be enemies. And we have, uh, this year is our 20th anniversary. This group of women has been together for 20 years and we still meet uh, regularly. We have um, raised funds for causes for uh, children in Gaza and orphans in Gaza and, and uh, other Palestinian causes, and then also um, projects that we endorse here in America. And the next slide, well, this is my book, and um, it's still available. Um, that's my last slide. And just devote the rest of our time to questions, and I'm eager to answer the questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Butter, for the amazing presentation. My name is Adam Levin, and I, I'd like to share with you a few of the questions we've collected from our audience. So, you've said that you were never truly free until you started to tell your story. How did your life change after you began speaking? What does sharing your story with others mean to you? Well, it took a long time, and it was very gradual, but Having it all pent up to me, inside me, it meant like people really never got to know me because when they asked me questions about my childhood, I didn't know how to answer them. And so they didn't know anything about me until I became an adult in America and they got to know me. And I was, I was freed when I was able to reveal how I had spent the first 15 years of my life and how I survived the Holocaust. So, thank you. But how has your perspective of being a Holocaust survivor changed over time? Well, in the, in the beginning, um, of course I was a survivor in the beginning, but I related it only to the Holocaust. And um, as, I, as life went on and I became familiar with so much that's going on all over the world, um, I felt that, um, well, first of all, being a survivor means that you have power and you have freedom and you can devote yourself to all kinds of causes. And so I felt it was important to, to fight for the, the people who, are, who don't have power, whose voices aren't heard, who are underprivileged. And that because I have this power and I have this strength and I know about all the injustice and crimes against humanity that I can fight against those and 
contribute to freedom and equality. Thank you. And to wrap up, what message would you like to leave with the students here? The, I have three messages that I would like to leave with the students. And I think they come out of my Holocaust experience. The first one is never be a bystander when you see injustice, when you see cruelty, when you see people being manipulated or discriminated against or their rights violated uh, because we all have a, a, a responsibility to protect and respect each other no matter who we are. Uh, we're all human, we're made of the same cloth and turning your back to things that don't represent your values and you don't agree with does not help to build a better world. You have to be an activist. You have to observe what's going on around you and take a part in protecting and respecting all others. Oh, I, that was only my first message. <laughs> Can I go on? Yeah. So the second one is refusing to be enemies. And uh, that came out of, of um, the organization, the Tuna, uh, 20 years of being very close to Palestinians, often Jews are um, influenced to consider Pal Palestinians the enemy. So there certainly has been conflict between Jews and Arabs and especially Palestinians for many, many years. But that's, that doesn't mean that all of them are bad. And I think it's important to get to know others, uh, to listen to their stories, to look into their eyes. And when you do that, no matter who they are, whether it's a matter of religion, nationality, ethni ethnicity, or gender, when you listen to their stories, you discover that what we have in common is much larger than our differences. And therefore, refusing to be enemies re re leads to a life that is much richer than if we keep, keep on the divides and, um, and the discrimination and, and the uh, differences that, that we are shown all over the world exist. So try to do away with those. And then my third message is, one person can make a difference. Each of us can make a difference because even when we think we are so small and the problems are so large, what we do matters, whether it's small or whether it's large, whatever we do in the right direction will make a difference. And that's how all of us can build a better world by doing what we can. Thank you. Dr. Butter, thank you so much for your time and being here. Uh, middle schoolers, I wanna thank you for the respect that you showed today. We, I'm so proud. I was standing in the back and just watching you all take it all in. So proud of you. I wanna especially thank Ms. Follett, um, who partnered with the CCE and partnered with Samantha and really just poured everything she had into this. Adam, we wanna thank you as well. Um, but we really deeply wanna thank Samantha Dorfman again, a junior, um, and when Dr. Butter says one person can make a difference, Samantha has made a difference. Samantha came out to us last year, said this is something that I feel is important, this is something that I want at Cary Academy, and she has worked really hard. So middle schoolers, this could be you, I'm just saying. 
Um, so Samantha, I don't know if you are still in here, but I know we'll see you at upper school. But again, thank you for the work that you did. I see someone pointing, am I? Stand up, round of applause. And I think we're good. Okay, I think we're good. Are there any directions from Ms. Stewart, Ms. Holland? Do they know where to go? All right. Thank you all so much.